time. Empress Crusade for Christ. And he has also spent several years in Cambodia as a missionary. He also served as a lecturer in East Asia School of Theology. He was also a tent speaker in our church camp before. He was married with three boys and one girl. And it's time to him for today's message. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, so good to see all of you here again this morning. And good to see all of you who are joining us uh, in whatever media, wherever you are from. I bring greetings to you, the peace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we can all enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit together in this beautiful room on this wonderful day to worship the Lord together. This morning, I bring you a topic called uh, Bullies, Coolies, and Khakis. Really, three groups of people that we can learn from the Bible. We're going to take from a passage from Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is a very, very special book. If you have been through the book of Ecclesiastes, some of you might even be stumbled by it. Why? Guess what? You know, it is in this book, for example, in chapter 3, the humans are compared to as like beasts. You see, is this from the Bible? You know? And then, in the very chapter that we're going to talk about here, it's going to talk about death. It's better than living. And it's even better not to be existing at all. Then you say, God, is this what you're talking to me? And then in chapter 7, it mentioned that, you know, wisdom is rare in men, but it's rarer in women. And all the women, you know, <laughs> maybe you protest against this. And then it go on to say, you know, do not be overly righteous and neither be overly wicked. And we scratch our head and we say, is the Bible telling us that it's okay to be wicked a little bit and no need to be overly righteous? And then it also says there's no hope in death. And we say, what does that mean when we talk about the resurrection from the dead? And so when we come to the book of Ecclesiastes, many of us may have a lot of problems. And so today, even before we talk about these three groups of people, I thought it's good that I make this introduction a little bit about what it means to study this book called Ecclesiastes. Firstly, you know, how do we read the book of Ecclesiastes? How do we book, read this book? You know, together with the four other books in the Old Testament, you know, we want to ask ourselves, what kind of book is the book of Ecclesiastes? Together with the four other kinds of books in the, in the Old Testament, we call these the wisdom or the poetry books. Okay? Together with Job, together with Psalms, Proverbs and the Songs of Solomon. These are called poetry or wisdom books. Now, the interesting thing is that when you come to this genre of books, that unlike the majority of the books in the Bible, where we really have God's direct voice speaking to His people, like for example, Thus says the Lord, Thou shall not, and things like that. You see, you need to understand the wisdom and poetry books in the Bible are more God's people's voice speaking back to God, reflecting about God, rather than God's direct voice giving us as a command or a promise for all of us. Okay? They, they are therefore responses to God rather than direct instructions from God. Second thing we need to understand is this. What is the place of Ecclesiastes really in the Bible? Or how should we even be reading or understanding Ecclesiastes as the Word of God? Now, to begin with, Ecclesiastes is really, certainly, you need to understand, you need to know it, it is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. But important thing we need to understand that it also anticipates the New Testament. What do I mean by this? Its purpose is really to create a vacuum in us, an appetite in us for God's out-of-the-world truth, which finds its true completion 
really finally in the New Testament. Think about this. When you go for a formal dinner, okay, the first thing they give you will not be the entree. Okay, the first thing that they give you will be the appetizer. You can almost put it this way that Ecclesiastes is like the appetizer. You work out your appetite for the main dish that will be coming. And especially a lot of them are found inspiration, full completion in the New Testament. But if you were to just solely engage in eating the appetizer because you like it so much, what will happen? You spoil your appetite. <laughs> you will, instead of working on the appetite, you will spoil your appetite. You may even vomit out of it. You may even can't get over it. And, and, and you may get depressed or sick. And that's why some people say that Ecclesiastes is a very pessimistic book. And it says reading Ecclesiastes in the, book, in the time of COVID, it's like two pessimists meeting one another. <laughs> and they look at one another and they never dare to shake hands because they don't shake hands. Huh? <laughs> they shake their heads and say, oh, cannot be. <laughs> so it can even get that worse. But I want to tell you this. The Ecclesiastes rightly understood actually has these purposes. It makes you crave for the real meaning in life. Okay? And it allows you to surrender to the wind of the Holy Spirit rather than the winds of the time, for which it says, you know, life is like the wind, meaningless, meaningless. Okay? And it helps you to really view life beyond under the sun that we are familiar with to life of eternity under the sun. S O N. So Ecclesiastes need to prime us. Just like actually the famous writer C.S. Lewis actually ever mentioned, you know, a phrase something like that. Is it if we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, it must mean that we were made for another world. And friends, that's what Ecclesiastes, and that's what the word of God prime us. To become that we are not satisfied with things that is in this world, that we want things that is out of this world that is in the heavenly. So, therefore, only by adding God into the equation will the pessimism of this life be transformed even unto optimism. And uh, I'm just going to share with you a few axioms right now as we even before we embark into the actual study. And it says that our outlook, okay, our, 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 our outlook should change our outlook altogether. And that's what Ecclesiastes should point us to. Go and look up rather than just look out. Okay? Corinne Tambun put it this way. It says, look around you and you will be distressed. Indeed, as you look around the COVID situation in Singapore, it can be distressing. Perhaps once upon a time, those people who are tested positive for COVID may just be statistics to you. But today, increasingly, we are beginning to find they are becoming familiar names to many of us. Ori Tenbun continues to say, look within you and sometimes you can get depressed. But we need to look up to Jesus. Then we will be at rest. Indeed, if I can summarize Ecclesiastes, I'll summarize it this way. The life under the sun adds years to your life. You just get older and older. A life under the sun, S O N, will actually add life to your years. Friends, this morning, are you adding just years to your life? Or are you adding life to your years? Okay, right now that we have gone into that foundational building on Ecclesiastes, I think we can run into Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and talk about the four kinds of people that we want to talk about. The first kind, I call them the bullies. They are actually found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. You see, bullies, they are really what I would call the oppressors. Remember, oppressors of life. They like to oppress other people. The second group of people in verse 4 to verse 6, 
We call them the coolies. Why coolies? Because the Bible called them they are the toilers, the people who toil and toil and toil. The workers, the people who are workaholic in a sense. Okay. Now, why I use the word coolies? See, the word coolie, if you have been long enough, <laughs> you understand. Actually, the word coolie is an European majority referring to the unskilled laborer or a porter hired for lower uh, uh, subsistence uh, wages, you know, hundreds, uh, well, hundred years ago. Okay, now it probably okay is derived from the Hindi word of kuli. Okay, why kuli? Okay, well, actually, there is actually a tribe in Western India that is called Kulis. Okay? About a hundred to two hundred years ago, when the British Empire was all over, over the place in Asia, especially, they recruited a lot of these cheap laborers. From all over, from this part of India, to be to be the manual laborers in, in many parts of the colony, including in Singapore and Malaysia, okay? and therefore people start calling these people coolies. And by and by, coolies begin become the term that we use for hard labor, people who do manual labor. In fact, okay, those of you who know Tamil may you know, just authenticate whether what I'm saying is true or not. But my research tell me. From Tamil, the word coolie actually also has the idea of hire or wages. Which one influenced who, we do not know. Okay, But even in Chinese, we have a transliteration of this. right? We call it coolie. And then if you understand Chinese, the word coolie is a very clever transliteration. It means bitter strength. This year, they use a lot of you know, strength, bitterness, just to do that work. Early Chinese who came to Southeast Asia were also coolie also. This is the second group of people that's mentioned in this book of Ecclesiastes chapter four. There's a third group that I want to introduce to you very quickly. It's the group I will call Kakis, okay, or friends or companions, verse seven to verse 12. The word Kakis come from the Malay word, okay, from the official Singlish dictionary in the internet. I found out that the word khakis in Malay really means leg or feet. Okay, but more importantly, it also refers to a close friend, okay, a buddy. Maybe you're wondering why khakis and legs become close friends. You can see, okay, how a pair of legs, a pair of feet can be like two friends together, sharing common things together, but like two legs, you can't do that with one. You need to do two together. So khakis are like good friends that are inseparable like that. Okay. Now, it is interesting for us to note this, that while the bullies are oppressive, while the coolies are obsessive in their work, bodies, khakis are actually cooperative. Okay. Cooperative. One to do. Uh, with one another. Now let's right now go into all of these three from the Bible passage. So first the bullies, verse 1 to verse 3. Turn with me to your Bible. I'm not just waiting for you. Okay. They are oppressions on others. Okay. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and right now in verse 1, it says this. Again, I look and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And in verse 2, we go on to say, And I declare that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. There are a few things that we can learn about bullying or oppressions over here. The first thing that we learn from verse 1 is that there is a prevalence, a prevalence of bullying and oppression. He says this, I look and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. 
In fact, this term under the sun occurs 27 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. As I mentioned to you earlier on, the book of Ecclesiastes is really a book of the observation of life from the human horizontal perspective of life as it exists under the sun. But it really, by doing so, help us create the crave and the hunger and to tell us that this is not enough. We need a vertical dimension of life under the S-O-N sun. Okay? Now, so this is a really existential um, observation that we see here. Okay? Everything taking place under the sun. Okay? It can also mean that oppressions happen to all. Okay? It is as prevalent as anything under the sun. Even if the teacher was Solomon, as many people think that the, the writer of this book is Solomon, okay? there are many oppressions that probably Solomon, in all his richness, in all his power, in all his wisdom, has sinned. But yet, Solomon must have berated himself. But I just don't have enough time. I just don't have enough opportunity. I just don't have enough energy. I just don't have enough platform to alleviate all the oppressions that I see under the sun. Even a man as great as Solomon will see his limitation and be pessimistic because of the oppression that he saw under the sun. And that is frustrating. Isn't it true for all of us? Day in, day out, we read the newspaper. We see many things under the sun that are oppressive. And we berate ourselves. We cannot do anything. We cannot do enough of what is around us. Okay? Oppressions that are taking place under the sun. Okay? Next, the second thing that we learn here is that there is the pain. There is the pain of bullying and oppression. When we talk to us about tears, it says, you know, I saw the tears, the tears of the oppressed. Have you seen the tears of the oppressed? I remember one day, in those days when I was serving in Cambodia many years ago, and when the country was still smarting, trying to learn democracy and freedom, and yet at the same time trying to guard their own personal wealth and selfish wealth. One day, I witnessed an oppression under the sun in broad daylight. It was on the main street in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, and there was this shirtless teenage boy whose old bicycle probably had just collided with a beautiful SUV driven by a powerful rich man. Probably there was a scratch, I do not know, but there was a commotion at the road and there was a jam. And oblivious to the jam that was caused, this rich, powerful man, guess what he was doing? One hand, he was grabbing the hand of this thin, skinny, shirtless boy. On another hand, guess what? He was wielding a pistol and pointing to the new boy, threatening him you know, with the pistol. Think about the trauma that must have left, been left in this young boy. Probably at that point of time, out in the road, he had no one to fend for him. He was powerless. He was voiceless against the oppression. Many of us, we may felt we are like that too. Okay? For that boy, it's seemingly that he was, you know, living out what Ecclesiastes says here. There was no comfort. And as though to just make this point even clearer, the, the Ecclesiastes writer continues, yeah, and there's no comforter. He repeated it a second time. Friends, perhaps you have experienced too, perhaps you have witnessed too, bullying, oppressions. Have you yourself too experienced oppressions when no one hear your cry, when you can't even have the chance to so-called defend yourself or even defend you? I'm thinking of one common way that we, we, may, we may have suffered when you are drivers. Out there, traffic, bull, traffic bullies, not traffic bullies, traffic bullies. You know? We experience them now and then, right? 
Those people who sometimes just cut in front of you suddenly without signaling, and there you are, you have to jam your brake. And you find that before you even you could scream, or before you even you could say that, you know, that's unfair. You know, you have to do all those, you know, reactive actions, and then that person ran away. It's very odd. I'm violated. But who is that to help me? Sometimes when a situation like this happens, you know, I always tell myself, I wish there's a traffic police somewhere. You can catch that person. Of course, usually it never happens. But for so many of us, it may happen in other ways. It may happen in your school. It may happen in your workplace, a bully from a more senior member. It may happen, perhaps, even in cyberspace, cyber bullies, people who offended you and you find that you are powerless, voiceless to voice out against these people. Well, no. The teacher thought that he could find a solution. He thought about perhaps the protection from bully and oppression. And I put this as a question mark. Because this was what he thought could be a solution. He says, you know, um, perhaps, you know, he says, verse 2, And I declare that the dead who have already died are happier than the living who are still alive. Actually, the NIV use here, the word declared, is not the best translation. The word declared, actually, is also the word for, in the original language that is used for praise and glory. Actually, the author is saying, actually, I give praise, I give glory to the dead who are already died, who already died because they are happier than the living. In short, he is seemingly, in our words today, say that it's better to die than to be living. Then again, we ask ourselves, oh God, this is from your word. <laughs> but I want to tell you, this is the word of God, but from a humanistic, horizontal perspective of what we think could be the solution to life. Okay? Perhaps there are people like this around us as well. I'm not sure. Perhaps, could it be you? You feel that this world is so oppressive, you'll be better off dead. Perhaps some people think it even more. You know, not just death, but non-existence. In verse 3, he says, but better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Logically, when you think about it, your mind will think about this way. Sometimes you say, I wish I'm dead. And sometimes you think, maybe I wish I'm not even around and nobody will feel the loss. You know? Maybe it's better you know, if I was not even born or if I've never existed. Ouch. Did I just accidentally stole a word from any of us here? Or from anybody that you know of under your breath? I don't know who you are or whether you are out there watching this over Zoom. But if this thought of dying, if this thought of taking your life, friends, ever come into your mind because you are so depressed of life, this sense that I'm so useless, I'm so insignificant, I'm so bothered, I'm so sian, I'm so pitching, I wish I had never existed. Perhaps it kept coming to your mind or in the mind of somebody that you are counseling and you know. You know something? I want to tell you here, the word of comfort from the word of God is this. You are in the thoughts of the Bible. Because these very thoughts of yours, negatively, has already been reflected in the word of God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 2. In verse 3. The Bible knows you and is speaking to you. You mean the Bible wants me to wish myself dead and be nothing? No, of course not. What does the Bible say? The Bible actually points to true power over bullying and oppression. You see, we learn many things actually from other parts of the Bible. As I mentioned, the book of Ecclesiastes is the appetizer 
that cause you to find the answer from other parts of the Bible. Other parts of the Bible, for example, in Matthew chapter 28, tell us that all powers, all authority in heaven belongs to God, belongs to Jesus. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. So when you're oppressed by an earthly power, realize that the greater power, realize that all the power is in Christ. All oppressions one day therefore will come to an end because he holds the ultimate power. He is in charge. He has all the power, all the authority, all means one, 100%. 100%. Then you say, why is the evil one? Why is the evil having seemingly power right now? He just relegate power for a time being, temporarily, temporarily, to these other powers. But ultimately, he has all the power. He has the last say over all oppressions, all bullies that can happen under the sun. He is the traffic police who will appear at his timing. And that is not a late timing. That will be the best timing. Trust me. You see, death and non-existence, they are not the end or the beginning. God is. God is. You don't find a solution to suffering in death in committing suicide. You find it in God, the Alpha, the Omega the beginning and the ending. Don't end it in your way. End it his way. Okay? The question is, do you have God in your picture? You see, God is just and he advocates for the oppressed and the bullied people. That's the other thing that I think we need to learn from here. That he wants you and I to participate in his work to bring about justice out of oppression. There are many verses you know, I'll put down here that talks about this. For example, in Job chapter 5, says, He saved the needy from the, from the sword in their mouth. He saved them from the clutches of the powerful. Can you not blame that promise? In Psalms 50 verse 6, He says, He is a God of justice. He could say He's the God of love. He could say He's the God of peace. Yes, He is, but He is also a God of justice. And he knows something? He wants all of us to practice that justice. Yeah. Not bully or oppress one another, as mentioned over here. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, uh, chapter 56, you know, he, he says this, you know, maintain justice. Do what is right. And I like what Jeremiah 20, 22, 3 says. says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Are we keeping quiet when somebody is being oppressed? The Lord, as much as He's unpleased that you are being oppressed, will be unpleased if you and I just fold our arms and keep quiet if there is un if there is an injustice happening around us, if there is oppression happening around us. And if you know someone who is suffering under bullies and oppressions and injustice, he wants us to speak out for all of them. Sometimes it takes an availability to listen, to experience and to demonstrate that kind of solidarity with those who are misunderstood and those who are oppressed. So one of the initiatives that uh, came out from uh, Bartley's church, the church that I attend, our missions month, it's an initiative that they say that maybe we can reach out to the foreign domestic workers that are employed by some of the church members or that comes to attend our uh, Filipino congregation or Indonesian congregation. And so they pair us up with these people so that we can go and visit them with a special gift, especially during this COVID season, and just to offer them a word of encouragement. I did it with my family last year. We offered ourselves to visit one of these domestic helpers who is worshipping in our church, uh, who doesn't know anybody else, uh, uh, Christians in Singapore, Singaporean Christians. Okay? 
And last year was the first time that we went to visit her with a gift and got to know her. This year, the call came again and said, who want to go again? So we put out our hands and said, we want to go again. So we went to visit this same lady again. Okay. And then this, this was the time that we visited her just in August this year. Okay. And I, I think, you know, it was wonderful. Because this time around, we could spend a longer time with her in prayer. Not only with her, but you can see that actually next to her, okay, is a man. Okay. We could also talk to the man in Chinese. Okay. And we were glad that we both, my wife and I, were able to kind of listen to them separately over the struggles that each of them faced as the employer over the employee and as the employee over the employers. Okay. But one important thing that we left uh, is us uh, feeling is this. It showed, that the, it showed the employer and it encouraged the helper that she has Singaporean church friends who cares enough during the COVID season to visit her with gifts you know, that were given to her. More important, it gives the helper a conduit to share her struggles with someone who now knows where she works and who she worked for. Every Sunday, she may have gone to church for the Filipino worship studies, but nobody knows the struggles that she faced with her, with her employer. Nobody knows the condition that she worked under. But by this little visit that we make to her house, we thank God that we are able to identify with her when she felt oppressed, when she felt injustice happening to her. So in the end, you know, we received a note from her and it was so powerful. It really lived in the hearts of my wife and I. This is what she said. A big thank you to you for being a part in my journey. Thank you for the special people in my life who have helped in without condition, understand with empathy, and who have listened without judgment. We can give thanks because we are united in Christ. Love, Lord. We thank God that there are oppressors, there are bullies, but we need not be the bullies. We can be the people who stand okay, for those who are being bullied. The second group we talk about here is the bullies in verse 4 to verse 6. And what does the verse say? It says, And I saw that all the toil all the achievement spring from one person's envy of another, and this too is meaningless in the chasing after the wind. Fool fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Let's talk about this. Firstly, we talk about work. We're talking a lot about toil. The word toil is mentioned many times in this passage. But before you get the wrong idea about work, let me just tell you this. Work actually is from God. Okay? And work is good. <laughs> in case you are blaming your work and say, I hate work. I want to tell you, work is from God. Work is good. You see, the first thing we learn is that God in the Bible himself is a worker. God is the creator. By creating, and that's the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. He is working. God is a worker. Second thing I want to let you know is this. Is that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Work is a gift from God. And God likes to go and work. God gave Adam work. Friends, we'll be sad if one day you cannot work. In fact, I just told John, I'm six, I just turned 60 this year. I just got my senior card, my passion card. I'm so proud of the fact that when I go up the bus, you know, now there's two sound feet, feet, not one sound feet. When I go to the MRT car, you know, the amber light come out. It's no longer just the green light. <laughs> yes, yeah. Special privileges. You know? Well, but you know, I'm actually worried. I say, what if I'm retired? Now? What am I going to do? <laughs> but I, I thank God. God really wants to give us work to enjoy. To enjoy the work. Okay? And he gave Adam work. You see, 
work, sometimes we got misunderstanding. We think that work is a result of the fall. No, work is not the result of the fall. But work is nearly made harder by the fall. You see, the curse, God says, curse is the ground because of you, what you've done, the fall. Okay, to painful toil, to painful work, you will eat food. Work becomes harder. But work is not a condemnation from God because of your sin. Okay? Next, we need to learn this. Is that work, unfortunately, can be distorted by sin. And that's why we can become foolish. Become so obsessed, workaholic. Now, what does the Bible tell us? How are we obsessed? How are we become foolish here? There are three things actually here that we can learn. First thing is that it's talking about envy. It says, I saw toy and all the achievements spring from one person's envy of another. You see, envy is the desire to get ahead of others in life. Envy is futile because no matter what, there will be others better than you. And you cannot compare and compare and compare. As they say, it is futile to always to keep up with the Joneses, isn't it? We heard about the saying. And what if you manage even to keep up with the Joneses? They say there'll be the Smiths. What if you can keep up with the Smiths? Then there'll be the Browns, then there'll be the Mars. <laughs> Of people, the comparison will be never ending. You see, if we treat work like a red race, what did they tell us? The winner will be the red. <laughs> Only the red. That's the problem. So don't let MD become your motivation of work. The second opposite of this is sloth. It says this what? Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Now, the ESB actually has a better translation here. So it's not only just ruin themselves. The ESV says, fools fold their hands and eat their own flesh. Eat their own flesh. You are as good as consuming yourself when you are so lazy and not working, when you're not producing anything. And the third problem of this is discontent. This is better one handful with tranquility than just two hands full of toil and the chasing of the wind. Now, what, what, what do I mean by this? You need to have two handful of toys. Means what? Means that both hands are occupied. There are some of us who are working like that. We are working and working and working. Just to make some money. To those of us who really are very, very short of cash, really, there are certain seasons in our life that we need to work like that. Yes. But to those of us, especially who have enough, but yet we want more to have a more luxurious life. And we say that I don't only just need to work with one hand, I want to work with two hands. What does that mean? You see, when you have two hands that are working, what happens? You have no more hands to hold your wife's hand. You have no more hand to hold on to the railing to prevent you from falling. You have no more hand to hold on to food to enjoy the food because both hands are in your work. You have no more hands to hold a toy to play. You have no more hands to offer to another person to offer as a helping hand. So better, the Bible says, to have one hand full with tranquility rather than have two hands into your work. So work not as a coolie. Really the answer to this is work not as a coolie. But work what I call as a master worker. Work as a master worker. What do I mean by this? You see, God wants us to bear His image as master worker. What is the image that He wants us to bear? You know, in the Bible, in Genesis 1, 27, 28, it talks about us created in God's image. Many people wonder, what is this image? Is this a physical image that God physically will look at Him and be like us? To the head, to the abdomen, to the limbs, or what? Really, I think the answer is found here. Okay, it says God created us in His image, and then verse twenty-eight tell us the image. To say the image is this: God blessed them. In other words, God want them to be like that, and God said to them, "Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth." Our God is a fruitful God. When He make the trees, He make the trees fruitful. When He make the animals, He make the animals. When he made the earth, he made the world fruitful. 
but he makes human. He says, be like him. Be to fool. Be a master worker that bear fruit, that cause fruits to come out of your garden, of your work. Stop doing it. Rule it. God is a ruler. God is sovereign. God has the control. God is saying, I delegate the control of this world. Learn to rule and organize the world. Learn to manage and steer it through the world. Are we doing that as a master worker? To be a master worker is to work like God. Is to consider work as directly assigned by God rather than blaming other people. Why give me so much work? I'd say, God, thank you. Work is assigned by you. Thus, we need to ask ourselves this question. It's a question that we found actually, I jumped ahead in the dark a bit. Okay? Found in verse 8. We ask this question, who am I calling? Who am I working for? Who am I working for? I want to ask you. Now, two farmers, they entered a horse each for a local race, a steeple chase race where the horse had to jump over hurdles and fences. Okay? Now, thinking that a professional rider might help him outdo his friend, one of the farmers actually engaged a crack jockey, a professional jockey, to ride his horse. The race came. The two horses belonging to these two farmers were leading the race until the last obstacle, the last fence, when both horses fell. And both the riders also fell off the horses. But the mishap actually did not affect the professional jockey. Okay? He quickly remounted and he went on and win the race. But at the finishing line, the farmer who had hired him was fuming with rage. What's the matter? The jockey asked. I won. Didn't I? Why is he so unhappy? Oh yes, wrote the farmer. You won all right, but you won riding on the wrong horse. You won riding on the wrong horse. Friends, I think you'll be sad for us. One day at the end of our life, that we saw ourselves riding, winning, but on the wrong horse. The question I want to ask you is this. Who are you working for? Yourself? Your boss? Your parents? Your spouse? Your family? Your children? Who are you working for? Looking for God? If you are doing, riding your horse and your horse is God in a sense, riding for God, then Colossians will be your motivation. You do whatever you want to do in what and deed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is for Him that I'm working. Okay? Whatever you do, you work it with all your heart as unto the Lord. Let this be a reminder to all of us. We talk about bullies. We talk about coolies. Two negative pictures that we should not do. The last picture is only a positive picture. It is copies. Verse 7 to verse 12. We talk about cooperation with God and with others. You see, bullies are oppressors. Cookie are cookies. Coolies are <laughs> obsessors. Okay? And we don't want to be them. We don't want it to be even among them to be like them. But the idea of companionship in verse 7 to 12 actually point to what life can be like living under the sun. S-O-N. Okay? Firstly, the solution of puppies of companionship, I want to tell you, is as simple as one, two, three. <laughs> okay? It could just make it as simple. Not that I say it's one, two, three, but it could just say one, two, three. What do I mean? Firstly, it says in verse 7, one is not good. Remember, one is not good. Okay? It says here, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. One. He had neither son nor brother alone. There was no end to his work, to his toy. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. 
for whom am I toiling? Remember the question I asked just now? He asked, why am I depriving himself? He was living for himself. Of enjoyment, this too is meaningless. This definitely will be meaningless if you are living for yourself. So continuing on this theme of toil and work, we now observe this lonely worker. One person, why is it not good? It's not good because he's all alone. He had no friends. He has no relative. He worked without end because he was never contented. Look, you know something? When I read this, it reminds me of another passage in the Bible. It may have come into your mind also. Okay? It reminds me really about the parable of the rich fool. Remember the parable of the rich fool with Jesus says this person who says that he he's become so rich, he decided to build a barn for himself and things like that. You know, in that parable, in that parable, it talks so many times about the word I, six times, I think, the word I, and the word myself, I think, three times. My, my, myself. Everything is for him alone. Okay? It reminds me of Charles Dickens' famous story. Okay, we are coming to Christmas. Huh? Ebenezer Scrooge. Okay? Ebenezer Scrooge. In that 19th century story, A Christmas Carol, Scrooge was that cold hearted miser who lived by himself and for himself. So much so that today we use this word Scrooge to talk about somebody who is very stingy. Right? Sadly, that is what the world teaches us, isn't it? You cannot count on others, you cannot trust others, trust only yourself. That is the world's mind. That is not from the word of God. Okay? But the Bible actually pointed out to us that we are created for community. Whether in the Christian secular or in a secular world, we are created for community. God looked around, for example, in Genesis chapter 1. And six times he mentions that everything that he sees that he created is good. And the seventh time, he said it is very good. But there's one time that he said that it's not good. Okay. When was that? The one time that he said it's not good was actually the time in Genesis 2.18. When he looked at Adam and he found that Adam was alone by himself. One. And God said, it's not good. It's not good for you to be alone. It's good for us to come as a community to worship God this, okay, to worship together. We are not just talking about here, uh, um, about being alone. Huh? We're talking about community. It's important. It's not good. One, it's not good. The Bible goes on to say, number two, two is better. Two is better. Verse 9 onwards tell us, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and there's no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered. Two can defend themselves. The Bible really sings a lot of praises about two. Pairs. Now here we are not just only talking about marriage. Although, of course, every God-centered marriage is living proof of this principle that we talk about here. But the teacher, the writer here, is referring to other relationships too. Okay? Now, there are four reasons why two are better okay, that we mentioned over here. I just want to pick it up for you. Firstly, two are better because of productivity. The two are better because they have a good return for their labor. You see, when two persons work well together, they accomplish more than twice a person, a two person can work. In other words, it's not one plus one equal two. Sometimes one plus one equal three equal four. It's what we call synergy. Okay, there's a multiplication effect. So two is better than one. Secondly, two is better than one because of accountability. It says when one falls, another one can account for him and help him. Okay? When one fall, another can help him out. Okay? No. I remember there was a week I was very busy. Okay? 
I got to conduct a Zoom training, okay, on a Saturday. On that Sunday, I had to preach in church. On that Sunday afternoon, I conduct another Zoom meeting, you know, uh, to do baptism class. Very busy week for me. And I remember how I've fallen in the past over Zoom meetings. <laughs> Having to try to, you know, on the one hand, teach. On the other hand, share screen. On the other hand, you know, you find that your computer is not strong enough, you know, and then they got jammed and they got hanged. <laughs> and everything and everybody, you know, just lost along the way. So I remember I recruited two brothers to help me in these two Zoom sessions. And when I look back, I said, God, indeed, two are better than one. But the two brothers actually helped me control everything in their computer. Nothing hanged. <laughs> everything went on smoothly. Two are better than one. Not only just for accountability, but for survivability. It says when two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Of course, it talks about marriage. You say, oh, your husband and wife keep warm. Yes. I want to tell you this. Actually, if you look carefully, the book of Ecclesiastes this really had its context on the travelers during the time of ancient Old Testament. And people had to travel long journey. In the desert, at night, the temperature can fall suddenly, opposite from the daytime when it's very hot. It can become freezing cold. And if you don't have enough blankets at those times, okay, and travel alone, okay, maybe you need two camel loads of blankets to keep yourself warm. You will die by being frozen. And so what do travelers need to do? They need to huddle together, lager together, you know, so that they keep each other warm. You know. So friends, that's really what it's about. So similarly today, there is a spiritual warm going through the life and believers. It's easy to be cold out there as a Christian alone. Okay? And to become numb, cold numb to the work of God. And eventually, frozen in your spiritual life. But when we are growing cold, the heat of another Christian, two is better than one. Can really warm this time. Let's begin to ask and look around for that warm from another fellow body Christian. Okay? Fourthly, it's about security. It says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Again, back to the traveller context that the author probably is referring to. When a traveller traveler, when a traveler travel through the desert, there may be bandits. Now what Jesus talked about in the story of the Good Samaritan. But if you had two persons walking together, you'll be able to fight over the bandits. Okay? And this is another reason why two is better than one. They can protect one another. So, friends, one call, the Bible tells us, is no good. Two is better, stronger. And then it goes on to say, three is not easily broken. Okay? A call of three strength is not easily broken. Okay? More so, by adding a third strength to the call. The teacher is pointing to more than two persons, perhaps even three, perhaps even four. We have a community like this that we all need. More so, the third court not only just represents a third entity, I think it is trying to hint to us the third court is another body, the body, the kaki, God himself. I always told marriage couples when I married them, I told them, no, sometimes it's good to have a third party. And they look at me, oh, what do you mean, party, sir? Have a third party. I said, that third party is God. Don't forget the third party of God in your marriage relationship. God is the glue between us, whether in marriage or in Christian community. So friends, you see this. Bullies, they oppress. Coolies, they are obsessed. Chasing after the wind. But khakis, of cooperation with God and with bodies, they are blessed. 
Kaki is like legs don't come in ones. You need two, you need a pair. You need to stand, to walk, to run, and even to sit properly. And if you look at some furniture, a furniture need more than two khakis. You need at least three. They tell us three is better than one. And one is not good. Two is better. Three, it is not easily broken. And this joining together of all these threads together in a community like this, in the end will become what? Perhaps, I can only say, God's purpose perhaps is to we pass all. We pass all into that tapestry we call church together. Every local church is really that unique tapestry and design, exhibiting His glory and His colors of coming together of different courts. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we thank you that you are the third cause in our relationship. Help us, Lord, to learn to be khakis to one another, to support one another like you have supported us. And especially for such a restricted time like this, in this COVID-19 pandemic or endemic, where many are suffering, perhaps financially, emotionally, physically. Help us not to look at ourselves alone as one. Help us to be sensitive khakis to one another. Help us to trust you for the darkest doubts in our life. Teach us to trust you. Knit us together as that great tapestry, boosting of your colors, of your intricacies to your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.